Good evening, friends. My name is Bobby Trice, and I serve as FCNL's Quaker Outreach Coordinator at FCNL. Welcome to our June Quaker Changemaker event, HR 40 and the Quaker Push for Reparations. I'm really excited for our conversation this evening, but before we get started, I'd like to ask my colleague Emma Holbert to share a little bit about how we'll gather this evening together. Thanks, Bobby, and hi, everyone. It's great to see you all. Uh, my name is Emma Holbert, and I'm the Program Assistant for Quaker Outreach at FCNL. Uh, and I'll be running technology for this event this evening, so I just have a few uh, tech considerations for you all before we begin. Uh, first, I see a lot of you have already started to do this, which is great. Uh, I invite you to introduce yourself in the chat, uh, share your name, uh, where you're tuning in from or where you live, and if you're a part of a meeting or church, uh, let us know which one that is. Uh, this is such a great way to build community virtually, um, and it's really fun to see who's here in the chat. Uh, as you can see, we are recording this event, um, but the audience will not be included in that recording, uh, just the speakers will be in that. Uh, that being said, we entirely understand if you feel more comfortable with your video off. Uh, another point is that captioning is available automatically. Uh, you can see my words popping up at the bottom of the screen. Uh, if that bothers you, you can click on the live transcript option on your Zoom toolbar and click hide subtitles on your own computer. Uh, we will have some time for you all to ask questions of our amazing panelists towards the end of the event. Uh, and we're gonna do our best to get to as many questions as we possibly can. Uh, we probably won't get to all of them, but we will try. Um, so please try to submit your questions in the chat uh, throughout the event as they come to you and I'll make sure to direct them to the panelists. Uh, for those of you that are calling in on the phone, you can press star nine to raise your hand if you have a question you'd like to ask. Uh, during the Q&A portion, and we'll unmute you at that point and uh, invite you to ask your question. Uh, but just a note for anyone that's not on the phone, we ask that you uh, ask your question via the chat. And finally, just feel free to contact me if you are in need of any sort of support or tech support throughout this event. Uh, you can either private chat me uh, or email me at eholbert at fcnl.org. All right, that's all for me. Back to you, Bobby. Thanks, Emma. So friends, I'm so grateful to be in experiences working for reparations. First up, we have uh, Abby Raman Davies, who is FCNL's domestic policy associate. As a part of the domestic policy team, she supports the legislative director and the domestic policy team's efforts to change government policy and practice for the better. Before joining FCNL, she was a humanity in action John Lewis Fellow in Atlanta, where she worked on issues ranging from homelessness, human trafficking, voter suppression, mass incarceration, migration, and the impact of refugees. She worked with local nonprofits in Georgia, such as the New Georgia Project, during Georgia's election primaries to protect the right to vote by monitoring polling booths, phone banking, and doing voter registration. Abby also worked at the Feminist Majority Foundation, where she wrote policy recommendations to fight child marriage and fought to protect women's health care access. Abby graduated summa cum laude from UC Berkeley with a master's in global studies, and she also graduated magna cum laude from California Polytechnic San Luis Obispo with a bachelor's degree in political science and a minor in French. Welcome, Abby. Next up, we have Lucy, Lucy Duncan, who is a co-founder and principal of Reparation Works, along with Rob Piegler, a consulting vehicle focusing on guiding organizations through a reparationist journey. She is an anti-racist organizer and educator and is currently the Truth and Reparations Education Fellow for the Truth Telling Project and the Grassroots Reparations Campaign. She serves as co-chair of the Philadelphia Mayor's Commission on Faith-Based and Interfaith Affairs, focusing on a campaign to invite 100 congregations into sincere reparations work. She served as Director of Friends Relations for the American Friends Service Committee from 2011 until January 2022, and in 2021, she published A Quaker Call to Abolition and Creation in Friends Journal. In 2020, she was lead organizer and co-facilitator for Radical Acting in Faith for White People. She was co-conceiver and is a member of the steering committee for the Quakers Uprooting Racism Community of Practice Project. She's a member of Green Street Friends Meeting, Philadelphia Yearly Meeting, serves on the Reparations Committee, and is currently engaged with their project of securing Black housing wealth in Germantown. Welcome to our wonderful panelists, Abby and Lucy. And before we get started with our conversation, please just share a few moments of grounding, centering silence with us, friends. Thank you for being here.
Thank you, friends. So in my role at FCNL, I'm situated to see a growing Quaker push to consider and commit to reparations for friends' complicity in slavery. From local meetings like Green Street to Britain Yearly Meeting to FCNL and other Quaker organizations, more and more Quaker communities are talking about planning and implementing work on reparations. From where I'm sitting, it feels like more Quakers than ever before are looking for ways to get involved with this substantive work to change material conditions of social inequality and systemic racism. Each FCNL priorities year, we receive more and more priorities process submissions um, naming HR 40 and other vehicles to legislate reparations from the government. And I'm seeing more local and regional Quaker reparations committees and working groups forming and deepening their work together. This movement in the Quaker world parallels a wider and broader call for substantive systemic repair for the centuries of racial oppression stemming from that original sin of slavery. So Abby and Lucy, I'm excited to be in conversation with you both about your work advancing reparations and the interconnections between your areas of work in different contexts to highlight just a few threads in this wider movement for substantive repair of historical and ongoing oppression. To get us started, could I ask you both, what exactly are reparations and the different forms they take? Abby, maybe you could get us started with this one. Yeah, and thank you for the such the warm introduction. So I guess like the textbook definition of reparations is making amends for a wrong that one has done either by helping those that have been wronged or by you know a monetary way. But when I think of reparations, specifically reparations for Black people, I think of it as a way for this nation to atone for the original sin of slavery. Because the trauma and hardship uh, economically, socially, and politically that affected Black people didn't end with slavery. After slavery came Jim Crow, segregation, redlining, mass incarceration, underfunded schools, I could keep going. And so, and this is, we really see this a lot today with the rise of white supremacy. And so, you know, reparations and with slavery, it has its vestiges. It didn't just affect the people who can directly, appro uh, directly prove that their ancestors were slaves. It affects all black people today. And so reparation comes in many forms. One is an apology for slavery, like I mentioned earlier. Another is monetary compensation. Four billion is the estimated amount of 4 million enslaved people held in 1860, which is more than all the factories, railroads, and banks combined in the United States. But despite the enormous impact that these people had on the United States economy, African-American people were never paid for their contributions. And subsequently, because of slavery and all the economic oppression that happened after, they haven't had the same access to economic opportunity as their white counterparts. So there's policy work like the bill HR 40 to establish the commission to study and develop preparation proposals for African Americans. And I think this bill also connects to the fact that we really need to work together and recognize the horrors of slavery and its effect on society. And I think that resistance of this and the kind of ideal of you know, getting over slavery has really contributed to the rise in white supremacy that we see today. Wow, thank you, Abby, for that very comprehensive definition and historical perspective connecting to the present before us now. Lucy, do you have anything to add? Um, I think that's a pretty good one. <laughs> Thanks, Abby. Um, and my own, the only thing I would add is I think that reparations is root level repair for the multi-generational harms of the institution of slavery, kind of what Abby was saying, uh, and it's many afterlives as she was illustrating those that didn't really end, it just trans, it transformed after, um, after the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, I think in the, in, in the UN definition, um, it includes rehabilitation, which in my view includes trauma healing. Um, we did a, rep, um, a revival this week on Monday and Reverend Naomi uh, for reparations and Reverend Naomi Washington Leapart started by talking about intergenerational trauma and epigenetics and the passing down of that. And so the, the and, and called for the, the way that the trauma of slavery lives in her own blood. And so, the reparations is a way to repair that. And, and I think um, trauma healing and, and some people really call for therapy as part of reparations is a part of it. 
um, in, in rehabilitation. Um, and then memorialization, like taking down Confederate monuments and changing them into community discerned art pieces. Like there's, um, this is happening in Charlottesville. They took down Robert E. Lee statue um, and um, they've melted it into ingots of metal and the community is doing a long process of discerning what that should be changed into. So it's also like changing our memorial landscape so that it, you're still telling the truth, but not, not uplifting uh, horrifying um, figures who, who were um, proponents of slavery uh, in that process. Um, and I think it's in atoning for the deep injustices and, and brutalities of the past and creating a pathway for a thriving future for wealth redistribution. And, and from my view, recreating the commons that really going back that far to really recreate a really different way of thinking about, um, uh, about land and resources that is much more about um, from, a, from a real culture of care rather than a culture of exploitation. Um, I think reparations is a spiritual and moral moment. The spiritual aspects are very real for me, the sense of repairing and atoning, as Abby talked about, across generations and holding responsibility for the depth of intergenerational harms, like really feeling it, um, taking it on in an embodied way. And for me, um, having done racial justice work for a long time, my experience of doing reparations is that it release, it's a tool for releasing bound energy. Um, and, um, uh, and, and like really literally materially releasing energy by enabling a sense of the ability to really make right these wrongs, that we can do this together, we can do this as Quakers, we can like make a real um, efforts to change. So that's what I would add. Wow, thank you both for these really holistic perspectives on what reparations are to you both as we began this conversation. I heard apology, material compensation, guarantees of non-repeat and rehabilitation, and these pieces around intergenerational trauma and healing and, and your perspective on it, Lucy, as a spiritual and moral movement. I'm also excited to hear more about um, your experience of this releasing sort of bound energy materially later on in our conversation. But to build on those perspectives that you've both shared, um, could I ask you both, how did you get involved in work advancing reparations? And how do your faith or values call you to do this work for reparations? Lucy, do you wanna start us off? Sure, and I see in the chat that John mentioned trauma healing for white people too. And, and it is really important to acknowledge that, that and, and I think it's different, like those are different contexts. Um, and, and that like Quakers in particular came and colonized Pennsylvania and um, inst and and William Penn was a slave and slaver in Pennsylvania, and le like fleeing from trauma, feeling fleeing fleeing from persecution, and then not healing from that trauma, and then passing that trauma on in these in these multiple ways as colonizers. Um, so I've been doing anti-racist work for a long time with a within AFSC. My work focused on supporting mostly white Quakers in supporting um, black indigenous and people of color led movements on the ground and learning to mindfully and in principal ways accompany and be co-conspirators for immigrants, for black folks, for incarcerated folks, et cetera. And over time, my sense is that all things lead to the economy. And though we sure need, we definitely need to address policy in so many multiple dimensions um, that really that we, we need to, we need the economic system to really be transformed. Um, I'm also an abolitionist and an abolition of systems of structural harm, including the prison industrial complex. And to me, reparations and abolition are two sides of a movement coin. Abolition to end um, and destructure the um, um, to end and destructure abusive structural systems and reparations is a tool to resource and fuel the movement for transmutation and transformation. And the way that I got involved is, um, I'll tell more about Green Street in a minute, but just having a sense of there being a co co coalescing around something that is, is really a, a healing modality, is something that can really heal and move us into the world that we really need. That's mater both materially, uh, spiritually, 
um, and relationally. Um, and, um, and, and so I think that, that for me, the movement was like, oh, this is coming upon reparations, understanding its depth of transformation. Um, and for the last few years, it's been like something that I really feel is, um, is, a, is a vehicle for my spiritual understanding of, um, of my responsibility as a white Quaker. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you for sharing how you were led to this work and excited to hear more about Green Street's story later on as well. Abby, how about you? What has led you to this work? Yeah, so I got involved through to this work through FCNL um, and my job here, but I think, you know, being an African-American woman growing up in America, reparations was always on my mind, you know, seeing my people be oppressed and gripped by the vestiges of slavery that I mentioned earlier, like segregation, redlining, underfunded schools, and everything that Black people have been through in this country, but still overcoming and wanting us to be able to do so much more, but, you know, being held back by racism and violence and the government as well. And then also this famous quote that I love that says, you know, if not you, then who? If not now, then when? Like, I've always had this innate sense of like, if I see something wrong, then I just can't sit back and ignore it and see what's happening and that I have to be part of the solution. So, you know, this is me as, you know, being part of the solution. And I also, you know, want this nation to, you know, heal and truly live up to these its promises that it made. And we can't heal unless we rectify the wrongs of, of the past. So I would say like my call to enact justice and inequality and my feelings of wanting to be part of the movement and not sit by is what really calls me to this work. Mm, thank you both. I'm, I'm feeling a theme here of the sort of different but intersecting ways people are led to work on the same cause of reparations, bringing with us the different identities and perspectives we hold to bear on that work. I've heard it as a matter of retrospective justice for the lasting legacies of slavery and as a matter of relational and spiritual repair work of healing work from you both. It's powerful. Thank you for sharing those stories and perspectives. Now that we have though a little bit more context about reparations and how you have each been led to the work, I'm curious to uh, learn a little bit more about your current focus areas, starting with the federal government. So here's a question for Abby. What work is being done in the national policy advocacy space around reparations broadly and HR 40 more specifically? Could you share a little bit about the outlook and goal for this year and how advocates are working to get there, as well as the longer term policy goal and vision we're working towards? Yeah, so FCNL is part of a coalition called the Why We Can't Wait Coalition, and it's with a bunch of other groups who are working on reparations. And our goal for this year was to get a commission by executive order by Juneteenth, which was June 19th, which just passed. Um, in April of 2021, the House Judiciary Committee for the first time marked up the bill, which cleared the bill to a House vote. We also got a record, a record of 250 confirmed yes votes of members in Congress for the bill and backings from hundreds of organizations across the nation. So there's enough support to pass this bill in the House, but with the support behind us, we're asking the, House, the White House to create the same commission by executive order. And you know, I just, I don't wanna assume that people know the significance of Juneteenth, but the significance of that day is that that's the day that all the slaves are freed. And so fortunately, you know, Juneteenth has passed and we weren't granted this goal um, and, you know, this just happened recently. So the coalition has kind of like regrouped and we're still figuring out like what's going to be our next steps, what's going to be our next moves, um, you know, and the long term goal is obviously to get the commission and for the commission to do its work and study the effects of slavery and then to get to the second part of the commission, which would be to get the actual reparations for African, African American people. And then I can speak about some of the tactics too that we've done. Most recently, um, we did a demonstration on the White House ellipse. So we did a press conference asking the president to enact this commission by executive order. And we also did um, a public display in the colors of the Pan-African flag. So black, green, and red. <laughs> um, and it was flowers, it was made of flowers and mulch. It was really beautiful carried them all to my back and I helped plant the flowers. So, you know, we've done, you know, stuff in the community. We've met with members of Congress. We've really we've done call-in dates, emails. We've really hit this at all different angles. And so 
that's kind of a short summary of the tactics we've done and what our main goals are. Thanks, Abby. And wow, I loved hearing about that demonstration and, and you know public installation with the flowers and the colors of the Pan-African flag. That sounds really powerful as a way to draw attention to the importance of reparations and to get some legislative movement on it, as well as all the other tactics you mentioned. To sort of connect, uh, Lucy, I know you've been involved with local city reparations policy and organizing in Philadelphia separate from your work at Green Street Meeting. Could you share a little bit more about your work uh, in that area? Sure. Um, about three years ago, um, uh, Neo, uh, Reverend Naomi Washington Leapart, who I knew from activist circles in the city, took me to, to breakfast when you could still do that before COVID, before times, and, um, and I invited me to apply to become a, a city commissioner for, um, on a commission for faith-based and interfaith affairs. And at this breakfast, she said, if you were part of this, what would you want to do? And I said, oh, we would do reparations. That's what we need to do. And uh, excuse the, the background noise. And so, um, and so the, I did apply and was appointed. And she, had, she's, she recruited an amazing set of interfaith leaders in the city, just really ready to do work, ready to like really dig in. And reparations became a really big part of, of what, we're, what we're up to. Um, and, um, and so we're, we, we have a vision of getting 100 um, majority white congregations in the city sincerely engaged, like Green Street, sincerely engaged in reparations work. And we have a vision that we can, like, there's massive wealth and that we can do, we can use this as a real vehicle for redistributive justice um, in the city and to really create, like, change the conditions on the ground. Um, and we just had a revival, Monday. I put a link in the chat, which was a, an extension of that. And we're doing a number of things that are following from in, in that campaign. So we're the grassroots reparations campaign, the truth telling project for which I'm a fellow has a call to people to do reparation Sabbaths and Re reparation Sundays in August. And so we're, we're inviting congregations in Philadelphia to do that in a mass, as massive a way as we can facilitate. Um, the grassroots reparations campaign offered trainings for that. So that's the next task. And then we're doing a course through the with the in collaboration with the grassroots reparations campaign for Philly faith leaders so they can learn how to do this and how to organize in their congregations towards this work. Um, and uh, and that those are those are some really important pieces. We also, there's a landmark bill in Philadelphia that was passed in 2005 called the Slavery Disclosure Act. And what it's about is that any vendor that does business with the city, like Wells Fargo Bank, for example, has to examine their complicity with slavery, make a, a searching uh, report on that, um, and, and is intended to make a reparations plan if there's, if there's complicity. And so many of them, if they if they're have any uh, history, do have that complicity. And right now, it's not being meaningfully enforced. So right now, people put submit those affidavits, and if they admit complicity, they're rejected as a vendor, which is not at all the idea. The idea is to really do a, a huge amount of uh, restributive justice in the city. So we're also trying to get um, either through executive order or through city council member for that to be funded with researchers so that it's meaningfully enforced. And it's actually, it was an COBRA legislation. It's a very, very powerful bill and it could, it could really do a lot of transformative work in the city. Um, we also, um, so we're also doing a medical debt relief campaign. And though that's not exclusively to black folks in the city, it will disproportionately impact black folks. And so there's um, uh, medical debt is incredibly predatory. And we are working with an organization called RIP Medical Debt. And we can relieve $5.6 million of medical debt for $35,000. That tells you about the markup. Um, and so we're we're going to be launching that fairly soon, um, and um, and we're 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 really like we want people to feel the energe energy of this work and the the depth of the energy with this work. And so um, a lot of this work is um, uh, we're partnering with the, the Truth Telling Project and the the um, the Grassroots Reparations, which is the home of the Grassroots Reparations campaign, and their slogan is that reparations is the midpoint between truth and reconciliation. And I think that they, 
the, the Reverend Naomi speaks very movingly about reconcile a relationship that doesn't exist. And if you have a relationship based on abuse and based on exploitation, it's not a real relationship. So reparations creates the conditions where you can have a real relationship and that can possibly lead to reconciliation. Um, and um, in the, if these multidimensional ways um, are approaches that are taken. Um, so that's some of the work that we're doing in the city. I think it's really exciting. Um, Monday was like, amazing the energy was just incredible and the testimony and the and the reasons for doing this um um were was really beautiful and so i i could feel what what this is the flavor of this movement in the city what it can be and what it can feel like and it's um it's exhilarating i mean it's it's important to grieve and acknowledge the hardship and the and to tell the truth but it's also incredibly powerful tool for for tra deep transformation Wow, uh, thank you, Lucy. Um, and thank you, Abby, for your answer as well. Lucy, I love that piece um, from the, the Truth Telling Project and Grassroots Campaign for Reparations about uh, reparations being the midpoint between truth and reconciliation. I, I just love that as framing conceptually for our understanding of reparations and the work before us. Um, I see in the chat a quick follow up question. Uh, Lucy, wondering if you have any more information about the medical debt campaign that you just mentioned? Sure, I'll put a link in the chat. Um, I'll put a couple links in the chat. Um, RIP Medical Debt. So the people who run it used to be um, wholesalers around debt. So they understand the the collection system and how and how um, you know this is this debt is sold for other people to make profit. And they're like, well, let's use this information to to abolish predatory medical debt. Um, and so they buy they work out deals where they buy the medical debt. So we, the 5.6 million is in Philadelphia. And then they find faith communities or other people to run a campaign to relieve that debt. Um, and so um, that's what we're gonna be doing. And there's been successful campaigns, I think in St. Louis and in other cities. So it's a, um, it's a, it, it, it seems like a, a really uh, pragmatic and also pretty visionary approach. And at FCNL, we love it when we can bring those two together, the, the prophecy and the pragmatism to bring about the necessary changes before us. Well, you know, from, from your answers, uh, I see a, a thread between advocacy on HR 40 and that executive order on reparations to the more state and local efforts to legislate and accelerate the movement for reparations that you mentioned, Lucy. You know, advocates and friends are using every advocacy tool and avenue and vehicle available to strengthen this push for reparations at all levels of government. But I'm curious what kind of reparations work is happening outside of policy spaces uh, among friends? Lucy, we've alluded uh, a bit to the projects at Green Street meeting around reparations. Could you speak to uh, uh, Green Street's work on reparations a little bit more and, and share that story with us? Sure, I'm, and I wanna just be really clear, I'm speaking from my experience. I'm gonna read a little bit of the minutes that we've written. Um, so we've had a reparations uh, committee. Uh, I've been a part of the reparations committee for about two years and we, um, um, two and a half years. And um, we got organized and we're trying to do different things. And the, 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 the way that that came about is that there was um, many conversations about anti-racism for years after Mike Brown was murdered. Those really, we started to do that monthly. And then, um, and then um, we, uh, as we were doing that, we needed to renovate our meeting house. And when we renovated our meeting house, we realized we had, um, we were like, well, how do we pay for this? This is gonna be expensive. And the trustees said, well, we have the money. So we had quite a bit of a um, unrestricted reserve. And we're like, wait, we do? What do how, what, how are we using this money? And is it in alignment with our values? And so we, um, and so we, um, we did a spirituality of money to examine our, our member Lola George was part of that. Um, and we, um, um, examined like what is what you know is kind of anti-capitalist so it was like really looking at what do we mean what does money mean how is it and how do what does it mean when um, how do how do our uses of it reflect who we are um, and it was out of that that a few of us said well let's start a reparations committee 
And we tried like getting different projects that we might do. And then we were like, no, we really need the meeting to commit to reparations. Um, and so I'm gonna read you a couple of minutes, pieces from the minutes that are about this process. So we had two, we had an invitation from the clerk and we presented at, um, at, two, um, at two business meetings. Um, several of the members had taken the grassroots reparations campaign reparations course, which was really good preparation for this. And it shifted some people pretty deeply. Um, that was a really powerful intervention. Um, and, um, and I think also just like the commitment, moving to the commitment was also a really important tra transition. So I'm gonna just read a few things from this, these minutes. So um, this is about the meeting in which we introduced the idea and, and started to talk about it. Um, Epchez offered us a prayer to ground us in humility, forgiveness, and love. We love ourselves unconditionally. We forgive ourselves unconditionally. We feel ourselves loving ourselves unconditionally. We feel ourselves forgiving ourselves unconditionally. They then shared information about what is reparations and how to budget for reparations. The legal definition of reparations, which has historically benefited people with power. So in the case of Haiti, where he, uh, Haiti had to pay reparations to France needs to be reimagined to recognize the immensity of what is owed to black people in this country. So we shared the UN definition of reparations. And then um, I'll read a couple more pieces of this. Um, re relational repair is foundational to reparations. Redistribution of wealth, which we'll talk about today is one pathway toward relational repair. Wealth is often a demonstration of inhumane priorities, greed, which is really the cause of poverty. So how we think about wealth is key in order to move toward reparations and toward right relationship. We live in and worship in a neighborhood of significant wealth inequality. The treasury of G Green Street Friends Meeting has a pool of funds amassed when people are struggling to put food on their tables and to remain in their homes. Lucy introduced the relational repair issue. Amber Matrio from New Orleans spoke to the people in the reparations course uh, from Grand Grassroots Reparations Campaign. The logic of our institutions, their subtle body is based on coloniality. To look at how we are animated and how our structures exist, we really need to examine them. We are invited to ground in our bodies before viewing Ms. Kimberly's Jones video, How Can We Win, which is a really excellent um, case for reparations. So I told you a little bit about it. I'm going to just read you the minute that we um, that we that we proved. So we presented the idea. We talked about budgeting for reparations, which includes um, budgeting if you are privileged and you are complicit. Budgeting half of your disposable income towards reparations is what's recommended. And for Green Street, that was going to be fifty thousand dollars a year. So two months later, we bought we brought um, a proposal to do that for ten years. Um, and this is the minute that was the approval of that. Green Street meeting unites with and approves the following proposal from the reparations committee. The reparations committee recommends that $50,000 annually be drawn over 10 years from reserves held by trustees and paid as wealth redistribution to black people in the United States as a step toward reparations. In keeping with the principles of reparations, we recommend these funds be paid to the people who have been harmed and used by them as they see fit. Therefore, we recommend entrusting the capable black members of the reparations committee to confer with other black people active in Green Street monthly meeting to discern and distribute these funds. During or before 2030, reparations committee recommends this practice be assessed to discern if further wealth redistribution is rightly ordered. So that's the minute. Um, and the black members recommended that we focus initially on securing black housing wealth in Germantown. So we've been running um, legal clinics in Germantown to do just that, to, to do wills, to untangle titles, and in some cases to pay legal fees and some in cases, some cases fines. And we've so far helped 80 Germantown neighbors um, to do that. Um, and the, the black members will figure out next if we're gonna keep doing that or if we're gonna move and pivot to something else. So that's what we've been doing. Wow. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you so much for sharing what y'all have been up to at Green Street. It's so helpful to hear the full arc of the story, the process that, you know, learning more about how the meeting thought about money and related to money, 
all the way through to this proposal and the process of grounding accountability for how the funds are used with the black members of the meeting. Thank you for, for sharing that for us. Um, now, before I go to our last question um, for, for Abby here, and before we turn to audience q and I just want to remind folks that we are taking questions for the panelists, and please do drop those questions into the chat, and Emma will make sure they, they uh, get to our panelists. So Abby, reflecting on what um, you sort of heard Lucy share about this very local reparations project at Green Street meeting, could you share a little bit about how you see uh, local reparations projects connecting with advocacy for federal reparations policy? Well, we actually take a lot of hope from what's happening locally because uh, locally, uh, there's a lot of cities that are doing reparations. I mean, Evanston, Evanston Illinois is actually the first city to give rep uh, reparations to black residents. Uh, some U.S. major, some U.S. mayors have pledged to pay reparations, such as Sacramento, Tallahassee, Los Angeles, St. Louis, Detroit, Hancock, San Francisco, Asheville, Providence, Austin, Kansas City, St. Paul, so all over the country. And actually, last year, California, my home state, became uh, became the first state under AB 3121 to establish a reparations tax task force, which was commissioned to study the state's role in perpetuating the legacy of slavery. So basically at the, this is a local version of what HR 40 would do for the whole country. And so actually about two weeks ago, the task force released their findings um, and it chronicled the harms against African the African-American community, starting with the transatlantic slave trade to the US institution of chattel slavery, emancipation, the broken promises of reconstruction, Jim Crow, and the harms of today. So it's actually one of the most extensive uh, government issue reports since the Kerner Commission in 1968. And so the Kerner Commission, if, if people don't know, it's the commission that says our nation is moving towards two societies, one, one black, one white, separate and unequal. So that famous commission. And then recently, a judge in Oklahoma ruled that a lawsuit against the city for its for its role in the 1921 massacre of Black Wall Street, which people if people don't know what that is, that is when a white mob came and burned down a street of Oklahoma uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, of a thriving Black neighborhood that had many businesses. So that's why it's called Black Wall Street. And so the plaintiffs include the last three known survivors who lived through the attack as children almost a century ago. So yeah, local movements are really leading the way and they're really giving us hope uh, at the federal level. So yeah, local movements are really doing it right. Uh, thank you both for sharing your perspectives and experiences working at different levels of policy on local projects and really lifting up how these, these pieces of work at different levels are all feeding into each other and supporting one another. And we sort of need work at all levels to push forward reparations more systemically in this country. Really appreciate you, you sharing those points and takeaways for us and our audience. I do think it's time probably to, to take a few questions from the audience. So um, thanks, Emma, for reminding folks to drop your questions in the chat. Feel free to keep them coming, but I do have a few here. Um, first is, what is a first step for my meeting or me as an individual, a friend, an advocate, if I want to be part of a reparations process or part of reparations advocacy? Do, who wants to go first with that one? I think it's a question for both, though. The first step. I think, Lucy, I think that's a good question for you. <laughs> um, it's interesting, like um, I presented on a Woodbrook panel today about this. And I think that I think that there's um, there's a story, there's this woman, Lottie Dula, who started reparations for slavery. She's a, a white woman. And um, and uh, and what she did is she went in her basement and she had like carried these boxes around, legacy from her family. And she looked and she discovered in those boxes a record of a, 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 um, a of a, I think a deed or um, or a record of um, an inheritance from her family that included I think I believe it's for like forty four people that that her, her family held in bondage, and she looked at that and she was like, oh, this is horrible. I need to make some. I may need to make this right. I, this is horrible. This is a huge weight. 
And I don't know that she'd done that much anti-racism work before that. And she just like, I need to do that. The rest of my life needs to be making this right. And she had saved money that she was gonna spend on school. And instead of spending that money on that, she did research about the descendants of the people that her family had enslaved and found them in his, and is supporting projects, including a play about that legacy with one of them. Um, and, and so for me, like doing the genea, doing your personal genealogical research, or or if you don't have uh, enslavers in your family, like assessing your complicity, which could be you know benefiting from the GI Bill, could be benefiting from um, dis you know really bad housing policies, like just really looking at that. Um, I would say don't look at it forever because as white people we are complicit and and take some some real. Uh, effort to um, to make amends, you know, as soon as you can. I think that it's really important to both look at that and then learn how to do this in ways that are deeply accountable to grassroots Black folks and 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 Black folks in general, and not just like like to really think carefully about how you do it and to find ways to really hold yourself uh, accountable. Um, and and whether that's grassroots groups or or other folks in in the work. In the case of Green Street, it's the black members of the meeting. That's that's a mechanism for the accountability. So I think that those things are are really important. And and like, I think that the other piece is to understand that this is this is going to be healing for you as well. This is really important work. This is healing for us for everyone. And the the, the there's um, a Benjamin Lay quote that is basically like, if we if we if we keep doing this out of our ignorance, knowing how harmful it is, then our condemnation is just. And the problem is that we all get condemned. Like it's not like climate change is demonstrating that it's not just those who are causing harm. It's 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 actually disproportionately um, condemning BIPOC people first. So the the repair needed is is really really important, and that and that we understand and activate in our lives from that. And and like think about. I mean, I think about um, John Woolman and how foundationally this kind of work changes the structures of your life and let it do that, let it do that. Find a way for it to do that. And I see that Peters talks about a uh, capitalist economic system. Um, um, and I actually think that reparations is a powerful tool for the abolition of capitalism. So it's actually a tool to do that. And I think if we take it really seriously, it can move us in that direction. Thank you, Lucy. I think I have a question for Abby here. Could you speak, uh, Abby, a little bit more to the progress on reparations policy at the federal level that you've seen in your work? Yeah, so the main progress I would say is the support that we've been able to build in the House on the bill. Um, I mean, getting so many confirmed yes votes is like unprecedented for like most bills, like when, you know, you want to convince someone to like bring it to the floor or pass it, you, you don't get like 215. I mean, that's such a huge number. And so I think that's the main progress that we've seen. But you know, it's really difficult. I mean, it's kind of like why I say local movements are really leading the way and they're giving us hope because um, right now at the federal level, you know, we haven't been able to get, like we weren't able to get the executive order um, from the president on June 19th and we haven't been able to get it on the actual floor for it to pass. So there is progress, um, of course, with many issues, it's not as far as we want. But um, I'm hoping, I think later today, they might ask you to do an action that will help us progress more. Thank you, Abby. Um, let's see, got another question here. Could you say more about reparations as relationship building and repair in addition to financial measures? Whoever wants to take this one first. Yeah, I think Lucy mentioned the relationship building, but I think for me, just like the ideal of repair, like recently, I mean, white supremacy has always been here, but we've seen like increases in 
um, and uptakes in white supremacist acts and violence. And I think that, you know, some people, you know, they might feel like, you know, we're past slavery, we're past all this stuff that was years ago. And I think, you know, just because you put you put your head in the sand doesn't mean it's going to go away, doesn't mean the pain and all the hurt is going to go away. And so I feel like in studying our past, we can actually get on the path of repair and not trying to sweep it under the rug and pretend like, you know, we've moved past it because we haven't. And, and as long as we don't, we're going to keep seeing these trends and trends and over and over again. And so I just wanted to really like talk about that repair part of it. I just, there's no repair until we study what we've done. Lucy, is there anything you want to add to that piece? Yeah, I mean, I, I, Abby's right. And, the, and I think that, I think there's this other part about like, I think um, white supremacy um, is often transmitted by being ahistorical, by us having to accept lies and deny these truths that are so evident, right? And, and so I think that the, the relationship is both with, you know, people who we owe a debt to um, and trans, and transgenerationally, but it's also it's also relationship with our ancestors and and like I talk about the com Quaker complicity um, with slavery. I mean William Penn as an enslaver, um, Quakers invented the penitentiary system. Uh, you know we're very complicit in inventing the penitentiary system, um, and and George Fox in his creation or advo advocating for a mild and gentle slavery was also a creator of like Christian uh, hegemony was the main uh, um, argument for, um, for slavery and for the, the decimation of indigenous people. And he introduced really was one of the introducers of white supremacy. Oh no, we'll just, we'll just worship with folks, you know? So I think that like, there's a deep, deep complicity. And so I think that the relationship also with our ancestors, where we have we have um, not been able to face the full truth of our own history um, as Quakers, as individual white people, is also part of the relational repair. Like let's let's really tell the truth about our people and the past and the past upon which our privilege is built. Um, and that's the foundation. I think Abby says it really well. Uh, like we have to start with the truth. Um, Marcus Redeker, who is the biographer of um, Benjamin Lay, wrote the fearless Benjamin Lay, talks about the truth is the beginning. You know, being able to really tell the truth of our history. Um, that's also why critical race theory is under assault because truth is under assault, and because when when people know the truth, they're going to uh, um, act differently. And I think that the, the relationship also with ourselves and with our own lineage creates an opening for changing the relationship with those in whose community, in the community that we share. And again, like reparations is a vehicle for having a real um, authentic relationship. Thank you, Lucy. I think we have time for one last question um, from the audience before we start wrapping up. Um, I think we'll go to uh, Theodora Mace and ask, I think for Abby, what are the real prospects of action on the federal level on reparations? Well, actually, I and our coalition members will tell you, this is actually like the strongest this reparations movement has ever been at the federal level, like not even close. Like the work that we've done this year, it's truly been amazing. Like I had mentioned the 215 yes votes in the house. I mean, that really is like, if you, you know, look at other bills, like you don't get that kind of commitment before the bill has even gone to the floor. So, you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's definitely an uphill battle. There's still a lot of work we have to do. Um, and support does not always translate to political will, but how you get that will is to get even more support and keep pushing and keep putting pressure and let your members of Congress know that it's unacceptable and things like that. So, you know, I believe that we will get there one day. And I, and I challenge that anyone who thinks that it's not realistic, there's many laws today that I'm sure if you looked at a couple of years ago, you'd be like, there's no way we'd get this. And we did. So we can do it. And with people like me and Lucy and you all and Bobby and everyone else working on this, 
I believe in us. And I just want to say our press conference that we did in the front of the White House, we got so much media attention. We got a lot of people that came from the community to come see the event. So people want this and people care. Yeah, Abby, that's absolutely true. On, on that note, this movement is growing. Even public opinion is growing, right? I, I read a Gallup poll last week that indicated a majority of Americans agree that the government is responsible for addressing the lingering effects of slavery. And so this broad public support and the current supporting reparations I'm seeing in and outside of Quaker communities are both really heartening trends to me. We're closer than we've ever been. So for our closing question, I'm curious to hear from you both what brings you hope when advocating for reparations? And how have you seen the potential and transformative impacts of sincere reparations work manifest in your different focus areas? So I would say for me, what really gives me hope is the diverse groups of people fighting for this. It's not just African-American people. We have Japanese American people, Jewish people, white people, young and old people. A lot of people care about this. I mean, I mentioned earlier that the organizations around the nation, but it's actually over 350 organizations and cities who care about reparations. I think another thing that gives me hope is that we have precedent. We're not the first group to ask reparations for something that the federal government did wrong. Japanese Americans were able to get reparations after a long struggle as well. And many of the questions that we're kind of talking about, like, is this really feasible at the federal level? They went through all of that as well. And, you know, look, they came out on the other side of it. So, you know, we're hoping to be that story too. And many of them work with us in our coalition today and they support the movement as well. Um, and then I think another thing that gives me hope was kind of what I mentioned about the local cities across the nations. You know, they're taking up reparations, they're creating commissions. These local movements give me hope. And, you know, I'm, as we see with many other policies, when enough local cities start taking stuff up, that creates a groundswell and gets the attention of the federal government. So all of those things give me hope and just being a part of the movement. Like I said, I'm very much of, if not you, then who, not when, like, I want to be part of the solution, and I hope that everyone here wants to be part of the solution with me, too. Amen, Abby. How about you, Lucy? Um, there's a couple of things that, that bring me hope. Um, on Saturday, um, we had our last legal clinic of um, uh, the Green Street work, and I was greeting people for the legal thing. We were also, um, we had lunch, we had a uh, cookout and we were serving people meals. So there's two things I wanna mention. One is that I was greeting people and at 10 a.m. Uh, a woman who had come to our March legal clinic showed up and she said, oh, I can't stay for the meal. I have someplace to go, but I wanted to thank you. She said, I now have a will for my home. And I was like, couldn't, I didn't have that before. And there was a reporter that was at that legal clinic. And this woman had a tree fall on her house and damage her deck. And she'd been trying and trying to get help for this. And she said, the reporter followed me after that legal clinic and wrote a, an article that was on Wednesday. And on Thursday, by Thursday, somebody had offered to fix it all. And I have a tree person coming next week and they're gonna fix my deck. She said, this would never have happened if you weren't here. So that gave me, a, that gave us all a lot of hope. And the other thing is that uh, members of the meeting turned to us and said on that day, who are, they're helping and part of um, eating the food. They said, this has changed our meeting. This has changed our meeting. It's changed the quality of our meeting and the quality of our relationships. And this has been such a hopeful thing to be doing together. So that, that gives me hope that it's not, it's, it's changing all of us as we do this work. The other thing that gives me a lot of hope is this revival, I hope you all will watch it on Monday, where um, all like, um, we were organizing this, I don't know, two or three months and people, and we'd say, do you wanna do this? And people were like, oh yeah, I wanna do this. We had spoken word, we had a gospel choir, we had this amazing vocalist. And then we had all this testimony about why it was needed as well as this energy, this release of energy of like, we can do this in as a city, as a faith community in the city, we can really, really do this. And that, and it felt like a portal. It felt like a portal into another world to have that energy so widely released. That was also giving me hope. And the last thing I'll say is that um, 
my partner and I are working with some white men who really want to do this work, a group of white men who have been doing their homework in accountable ways to Black, Indigenous, people of color, and they, they are businessmen mostly, and they're like, they really, really want to do reparations, and they want to do it in a deep way, and they want to teach other white folks how to do it, and, and I'm like, oh, this is, I mean, it's, it's amazing to work with them and to see their readiness to do that, and so, um, so reparation has tangible hope. Um, it is tangible hope for really like changing the foundational uh, conditions. And somebody said something about like, isn't it just too little? And and I think that um, that that as we work, we can really make a, a a tsunami of this as a as a as a force. As white people talk to other white people, as the organizing is really accountable to Black folks, as HR forty gets passed, there there really can be a a deep movement. Um, and I, I think the truth telling project grassroots reparations campaign are sort of in the nexus of that. It's really powerful to work with those folks as they see the swelling of that movement. And as Abby has, has so well um, uh, and clearly articulated. If not us, then who? If not now, then when? I think we'll close on that note. Thank you so much, Lucy and Abby, for your time and for your work moving forward this movement for reparations that, as you both have said, is such has such promise for healing, for real substantive repair of historical and ongoing oppression. I'm just humbled and honored to be a part of this conversation and a part of this movement with you both. Thank you so much for your time. And I think I'll um, turn it over to Emma to wrap us up now. Yeah, thank you, Bobby, and thank you both so much. Uh, quickly, before we conclude our event for the evening, I just want to share a few things uh, with you all. Uh, Abby referenced this earlier, but if you were at all inspired by tonight's discussion and want to take action, uh, a great first step is our action alert that I'll put in the chat now. Um, as both the panelists were saying, this is not the only step, but it's a great first way to start to get involved in all of this. Uh, the next thing I'll flag for you all is our next month's Quaker Changemaker event will be on gun violence prevention, um, and that'll take place on July 27th at 6.30 p.m. Eastern time. I will have a registration page up soon, so stay tuned for that. Uh, and finally, just a note, there's been a lot of really great resources in the chat. Um, I'll make sure to include all of those along with the recording in a follow-up email to all of you tomorrow. Uh, so don't worry about trying to save all of those now. I'll make sure uh, they all get to you. And on that note, I just want to say thank you all so much for joining this Quaker Changemaker event. Uh, a huge thank you to Lucy and Abby, our amazing panelists, and to Bobby for moderating. Uh, I hope you all have a great night, and I hope to see you next month. <laughs>